Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you a man who has been so far ahead of the pack that if I said he was cutting edge, I'd actually be insulting him for being slow. This is the man who taught us that ulcers could be treated through antibiotics, that kidney stones were actually a calcium deficiency, that rheumatoid arthritis was an immune problem that, again, could be treated with antibiotics. All these are mainstream strategies today, but 10 or 20 years ago when Doc started, it was very avant-garde. In fact, probably heresy. I want to get into today Doc's newest statement, which is exercise without supplementation is suicide. And Doc, this is a very intriguing concept, but you know, down through the years, you've had so many things be proven right time and time again. I guess my first question to you is, are you the Sherlock Holmes of a health care? Uh, I like to think so. I, I think that's probably a pretty kind description of what I do. And, of course, the thing that made Sherlock Holmes famous was the fact that he would say just the opposite of what Scotland Yard was saying, and he was always right. I'd say you hit the nail right on the head. I like to be a Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> what got you onto this line of thinking, especially with the athletes? Right now, everybody's telling folks to exercise, so are they just putting their head in the noose? They're actually putting their head in the noose. They're actually cutting their life by 30, 40, 50 years if they exercise and don't supplement. Where I ran into this was about 50 years ago, people began to study what sweat was. And they are these little bitty articles in biochemistry journals, the makeup of sweat. And it was very interesting. Most people thought sweat was primarily just salt and water. But sweat contains everything that's in your blood. And as you sweat, the primary purpose, of course, is to cool your body. But you're also losing nutrients. You're losing amino acids. You're losing vitamins. You're losing major minerals. You're losing electrolytes. You're losing trace minerals, rare earths. And it's a kind of a trickle chart. It's kind of like the toilet that just sort of runs a little bit, drip, drip, drip. And you get a water bill for 500 bucks at the end of the month. It doesn't seem like much, but it does, in fact, cost you in health and longevity. And so about 25 years ago, because I was an athlete in high school and college, I played football and wrestled. Of course, you sweat a lot in both those sports. And I only weighed 123 pounds and played middle linebacker and played offensive center. That's back in the old days when the players played both offense and defense. And only at 123 pounds, I was very aggressive, but never got an injury. And all these big guys, 200, 240 pounds, were always getting injuries in their ankles and so forth. And the reason I didn't was because living on the farm, I was able to have access to trace minerals that we gave to calves. And so putting together practical experience and taking advantage of some, what was 50 years ago, esoteric research, you know, what's in sweat kind of thing, put it together and came up about 25 years ago that you were, in fact, throwing your life away if you were exercising and not replacing the minerals you're sweating out. Wow. You know, it kind of reminds me back, you know, I don't even know when this was, but all of a sudden jogging came up, and was it Bill Kick? Jim Fix. Fix, okay. <laughs> You're close. Jim Fix, uh, spelled with two X's, F-I-X-X. -X. And, of course, he died at 52, and he wrote all the books, Run Your Way to Health, Jog Your Way to Health, and there wouldn't be any running shoes. And, yeah, wasn't it a number of the runners, including him, just all of a sudden died? They all do. They all die suddenly. Pretty profound statement. All these guys are supposed to be healthy. They have 4% body fat. What it is, they're sweating out all of their minerals, which protect them from various diseases, including ruptured aneurysms and including heart attacks. In fact, there was a long-distance runner who died in July of 2000. His name was Leonard Hilton. He ran the sub-four-minute mile 32 times, and he was a student of Jim Fix's and always praised Jim Fix and all his knowledge and training techniques. And Jim Fix died at 52, and Leonard Hilton, Jim Fix's student, died at 52. That's pretty much what you're going to get. There has never been a professional athlete who lived to be 100. And if exercise in of itself was useful for health and longevity, there should be a lot of professional athletes living to be 100, not a single one, Craig. Wow. It might have been you that says a couch potato is actually living longer than these guys. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's me. I like to teach people the basic truth by saying something that's very provocative. That way they remember the concept. But basically what I did, since there was lots of articles written by long-distance runners saying, hey, you guys, we can get high, we can make our own opium in our brain, and you can get drugged out running long distances here and get into la-la land legally, not worry about getting arrested or anything, just by running. You can lower your cholesterol by running. You can lower your body weight a couple of points. You can get your body percentage of fat down. There's all kinds of wonders to running, how healthy it is. It's good for the cardiovascular system. But it always kind of fascinated me. There was never anything that said athletes live longer. So I decided to do my own survey, and I started looking at obituaries of professional athletes and university and college athletes compared with obituaries of couch potatoes. It's always kind of funny that librarians live to be 103, 104, conductors live to be 89, 95, and housewives live to be 115 and so forth, and the old couch potato lives to be 88 to 120. 
And professional athletes, the average lifespan is 62 to 65. The ones who play the most, the ones who are the stars, die the youngest. And you look at some of the famous ones, Red Grange, Jesse Owens, people like Wilma Rudolph, Babe Zaharias. You're probably too young to remember her, but she was one of the first great women athletes who could whip men in about 10 different sports. And then there was people like Will Chamberlain, age 63, a congestive heart failure. Walter Payton, 45 years of age, died uh, while he was waiting for a liver transplant. And he was a pristine athlete, never did drugs, never smoked, never did alcohol. I know the basketball player that was a real... Reggie Lewis, 27 years old. There we go. Died of a cardiomyopathy, heart attack, a simple selenium deficiency. He was about as fit as a human being could get. Then there was Sergey Grinkoff, 28 years old, a two-time gold medal winner in figure skating. It's not just basketball players or track stars. You can be a figure skater and die young. You can be a boxer. You can be a baseball player. I have a lot of very famous baseball players. Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Don Drysdale. I have all their obituaries. I actually have one was a pitcher for the San Diego Padres, and he was only 24 years old, and he was felled by a cardiomyopathy heart attack, and they were just shocked because he'd just come up from the minors. You're yeah. sweating and not replacing those minerals you're sweating out. You're doomed to have a lot of injuries and anything that might relate to mineral and nutrient deficiencies, and certainly you're going to shorten your life if you're not replacing everything you're sweating out. Wow, that's incredible, because I remember particularly with Reggie, didn't he have what's called that the dream team of cardiologists, and he died anyways? <laughs> He had the dream team of cardiologists, so they paid these 12 cardiologists a million dollars each to save him. And the interesting thing was, a year and a half after Reggie died, the captain, the chairman of the dream team of cardiologists, died at age 47 himself of the same disease, cardiomyopathy, heart disease. And he was a Boston Marathon run runner. He'd finished the Boston Marathon three times, this physician, and died of the same disease at age 47. Can't these guys figure this out? <laughs> well, what happens is, they hire these personal trainers, and they hire trainers, and they hire people who are nutritionists, and they're worried about their fat intake, and they're worried about strength training. They believe falsely that strength training is the answer for joint health. The more muscle you build up around a joint, the less likely you are to injure it. That's absolutely nonsense. Just ask Bo Jackson. You remember him? He was this great two-sports player, professional player in baseball and football, and he dislocated a hip joint and fractured the head of the femur the ball part of the ball and socket joint, and they talked him into putting an artificial joint in, and of course, he ran around like Chester from the old Gunsmoke days. <laughs> I remember him. It was that one leg, and he was a huge man. His thighs were bigger around than my chest. He was a big man. And so they said, well, why don't we even, yeah, we'll just take the good hip, and we'll put in an artificial joint in there, and then you'll be Superman. Well, of course, after that happened, he hit a few baseballs, and that was about it. His career was done. But if he'd have been supplementing properly, these guys could play into their 40s and 50s. I've seen this happen. We have a lot of professional athletes who had to quit their sport after 8, 10, 12 years because of joint problems. We get them on our nutrient replacement programs. And just in six months' time, they're stronger and more fit and have more agility and flexibility than they were when they were actually playing. And they just they shake their heads and they say, why didn't our high-priced million-dollar-a-year trainers tell us this? And they say, well, they don't know it because they're reading from doctor-written nutrition books. They're reading from doctor-written sports medicine books. These folks just don't seem to have gotten the message yet. No, they haven't because they make their money by doing joint replacement surgeries. They make their money by doing arthroscopic surgery. They make their money by removing meniscus. They make their money by repairing torn ligaments. And so that's what they're in the business of doing. They are not interested in preventing these injuries because they make their money by repairing them. Got it. Wasn't it Holyfield that actually was able to come back? Right, you know, Evander Holyfield is kind of an interesting guy. He quit in one of his fights. I guess it was against Tyson. He just quit. He just couldn't go on. Because of lack of strength, his heart began to give out. He had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart disease. And through a mutual friend, actually a guy who lives across the street from Evander Holyfield, Andrew Young, you may remember the name, he was an ambassador to the UN, and we were able to save Andrew Young's knees, and Andy Young said, well, why don't I see if I can take the message of Evander Holyfield, and we got Evander Holyfield taking some selenium, and sure enough, we were able to get his heart going again through the selenium supplementation, actually a more complete program than that, but it included uh, special interest in the selenium part of the program, and as you see, he was able to come back and defend his title several times, and of course he's been boxing, uh, not necessarily to the level he'd want to be, he's lost the last couple of fights, but he's a remarkable athlete, and without that supplementation, he would have been finished a long time ago. Looking at your background, you have kind of a unique background to be talking about human nutrition, but I think it probably gives you an interesting perspective. 
I know you started as an ag major and went to veterinary school first, and then you did a lot of research with the human studies. Well, I think the advantage that gives me, Craig, is that in animals, we don't have insurance. We don't have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, major medical, hospitalization, Medicare, and Medicaid. We don't have personal trainers. We don't have personal nutritionists. And so what we had to learn to do was prevent and cure diseases in animals with nutritional formulas, very economical, to do it that way on a herd basis, put everything in their feed pellets. And that's why we have mouse pellets, rat pellets, hamster pellets, guinea pig pellets, rabbit pellets, duck pellets, goose pellets, hen laying mash, chick pellets, poult pellets, horse pellets, sheep pellets, and so on. And dog food canned, dried, cat food canned and dried. And every one of these rations is a perfect mix of every known nutrient necessary for these animals. And if we were to use a human health care type of system, especially the sports medicine system in animals, it would be a sticker shock for you. Your hamburger would cost you $275 a pound just to pay for the health care. And so I decided to take the same concept that we did for animals, where we have special diets for animals with heart disease, kidney disease, intestinal disease, liver disease, eye disease, and so on. These diets are formulated so the animal can't pick out what they want. It has everything in there necessary to focus nutritionally on that particular organ or organ system. And I just said, well, if it works in animals so well, which it does, why wouldn't it work in people? And so about, I'd say, 1978, after trying from 64 to 78, which is 14, 15 years, I'd written my scientific articles and books and lectured to doctors, and I couldn't get doctors interested in the concept. They'd pat me on the back and say, oh, that's very interesting, but that's in animals, not people. So I went back to school and became a physician and began to use these preventative and treatment concepts with nutrition like we did in animals, and certainly the concept works like a charm in people just like it does in animals. That's maybe why the gentleman that told me about you said, talk to Doc Wallach, he may treat you like a dog, but you'll get better. <laughs> that was a little thing that my patients came up with because I used to hang my veterinary degree on the wall next to the medical degree, and patients, they come in, their eyes would get real big, but after a while, they kind of realized where I was coming from, and they'd start with a joke telling their friends, hey, if you're not happy with what your doctor is doing for you... Go see Wallach. Now, he'll treat you like a dog, but you get better. <laughs> Dr. Wallach, talking about athletes, we've talked about a lot of the professional athletes. How about the younger ones, high school, college players? Are they at risk just the same way? Oh, absolutely. According to the Center for Disease Control out of Atlanta, Craig, a lot of these young athletes under the age of 30 drop dead each year while they're training, exercising, or participating in sport. Now, I saw some figures earlier this month which said that the death rate from sudden heart attacks in young athletes has actually gone up by 10% in the last year. And so there's no nutrients of any value in Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, Gatorade, and so forth, and water, just plain water. And so these young athletes wanting to get scholarships, wanting to get it into the pros, and as a result, they train hard. They do all the right things. They do what their trainers tell them to do. They just don't supplement properly. And as a result, a lot of these kids who are really professional-level quality athletes, even when they're in junior high and high school, these kids will get injuries that will kill their career. And there's nothing worse than these people training these kids, getting them up to the point where they are really superstars, and then a knee blows out, or they tear an Achilles tendon, or they get a shoulder injury, they get a back or neck injury, they get a finger injury, and they're pretty much done, and their whole life is ruined because their whole life was focused on these athletics. And these kids also have a high rate of depression and suicide because their whole life has been built around being the superstar of the neighborhood and the school. In fact, suicide in high school athletes is the single biggest cause of death in high school athletes. Wow, that's astonishing. Not to mention kids like that or young people like that blowing out a knee. They've just thrown away a lot of money. That's correct. Not only the investment they've already put in, but paying forward, so to speak, their future investment and their life because they know when they excel and so forth and have all these benefits of the training and they have just natural talent. It's really a shame. And so I do make an appeal to parents and coaches and trainers out there who might be listening to call your toll-free number, get the information, and give these young athletes a more complete replacement program so that if they do get injured, you know, if you run into a wall, you're going to get injured, you can repair quicker. The likelihood of injury is very, very slim just simply by replacing everything you're sweating out. Got it. People listening to this, a lot of folks, we're talking about nutrition especially, will say, well, how long do I need to take these sort of things? You take all these supplements properly until you stop using oxygen. Got it. <laughs> There's a reason for that, and that's because our food does not contain these nutrients, and no matter how well you eat, you could spend a million dollars per meal, and you're still not going to get everything you need by eating. And so you do have to consciously supplement, whether you sweat or not. But if you sweat, you're really obligated to do it in a very, very intense way.
Calcium deficiency, from everything that we've talked about in the past, seems to be, again, you to use the word epidemic. And wasn't that what got your attention at one point in time with twitching eye or something, if I remember the story? Yeah, my personal story was I was a teenager, 14 years old, and my eyelids would twitch so bad, you could actually hear them making a noise, clicking. <laughs> and I asked my mom what it was, and she didn't know, and she panicked because she could see my eyelids jerking. It looked like I had some kind of electrical thing on there. <laughs> my eyelids were just twitching. It looked awful. And she took me to an eye doctor. I had to drive 80 miles to St. Louis to go to one of the top eye doctors. And after a long day, she finally determined that my eyelashes were long and they were hitting my glasses and curling back and tickling my eyeballs. And she gave me a Maybelline mascara eyelash brush, and she said, I have to retrain my eyelashes. Oh, I bet that went over well. Oh, yeah. It didn't go over very well. Of course, I was playing football and wrestling, and I could just imagine myself sitting on the bench there with 25 or 30 200-pound guys playing with my eyelashes with a Maybelline eyelash brush. And so I dismissed that suggestion, went to the school library, and started looking up muscle cramps and muscle twitches in a health book written by a couple of nurses. And they said very clearly that muscle cramps and muscle twitches are caused by calcium deficiency. And so I went home and I started using the calf pellets that we gave the calves. We had plenty of calcium in. When all the other kids were eating candy and, and so forth, I was eating calf pellets. And so at a very early age, I was very aware that mineral supplements were very, very necessary. And like I said, I would take a fencing tool and knock a corner off one of the trace mineral salt blocks. I would take calcium supplements because I was small. And playing football, middle linebacker, I just never got injured in four years of playing because even though I was extremely aggressive, because I was taking all the raw materials to rebuild my body. And in wrestling, where you sweat more than anything else, I would spend most of my day not in class. I was running up and down the stadium steps, the football stadiums, just to stay fit for my wrestling program. And I know I sweat out a couple of quarts of sweat a day. And without replacing those nutrients, I know I would have some injuries at least and certainly may have died. And uh, you may recall a couple of years ago there were many wrestlers who died suddenly. Yes. Tried to blame it on some of the supplements they were taking. But basically they were wearing rubber suits and trying to lose 5 or 10 pounds to get down into a lower weight class. And they just sweat out all their nutrients and died suddenly from that. Well, Doc, what if someone were to come to you and say, I have a son that's in football or does a lot of athletics or even a professional athlete, what would you tell them to protect themselves? Well, basically what they have to do is take a good basic supplement program that gives them all 90 essential nutrients plus the raw materials to develop properly and maintain repair, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, bone matrix, lay down the minerals necessary for a healthy and happy bone. Also, instead of just using water or Gatorade or one of the soft drinks as a fluid replacement as they're sweating before, during, and after the events in the training session, a sports drink, it has amino acids, vitamins, electrolytes, major minerals, trace minerals, and rare earths in it, plus three time-release energy sources, tastes very good, and it's a concentrate. Uh, you put an ounce of this into a quart of water, a liter of water, and sip on that. You're going to replace, you're going to trickle charge everything back into your system that you're losing as you sweat. And not only will this athlete reduce their risk of death and injury, but also their stamina is going to go way up. They will be much stronger in the third and fourth quarters. They'll be much stronger in the long-distance races in that last lap. They're going to be much stronger in any event than the opponents. Excellent. So, Dr. Walk, we've kind of looked at the problem out there. Minerals seem to be the kingpin of what you're talking about, and it's funny because everybody talks vitamins. It's a good observation, Craig, because vitamins, if you work real hard, you can actually get vitamins out of your food because plants can take carbon out of the air and manufacture vitamin A and beta carotene and all the B vitamins, C, E, and K, but plants cannot manufacture minerals. There's not a single function in your body that can take place without mineral cofactors. You cannot utilize oxygen. You cannot utilize energy. You cannot utilize vitamins. You can't utilize the proteins. You can't utilize enzymes. You cannot utilize hormones. Nothing in your body will work without one or more mineral cofactors, and yet our foods cannot manufacture minerals like they do vitamins. And so over the years, I realized that the minerals were the limiting factor and the lack of minerals were the limiting factor to long life, healthfulness, athletic prowess, and stamina. And I probably have known that since I was 14 years old and certainly developed and collected a lot of information to back up that belief over the years. And basically, minerals are the limiting factor, and so you have to consciously supplement with them properly, especially if you're an athlete and sweating. The vitamins, even a blind hog will get an A-carton sometimes. <laughs> they supplement, fortify white bread, they fortify rice, they fortify chocolate bars, they fortify just about everything. What's this document 264 you faxed over to me? 
Well, U.S. Senate Document 264 was actually published by the U.S. Senate in 1936. And the U.S. Senate published this back in 1936, and it said at that time that there was no longer sufficient amounts of minerals in our farm and rain soils to give us everything we needed. And as a result, the plants, the food plants that were grown there were minerally deficient. As a result, the animals and people who ate these minerally deficient crops got mineral deficiency diseases. And according to U.S. Senate Document 264, the only way to prevent and cure these mineral deficiency diseases was to supplement properly. And we've known this in 1936. That's back at the time when we began to supplement vitamins and minerals and trace minerals in the animal feeds and came up with mouse pellets and rat pellets and hamster pellets and guinea pig pellets and horse pellets and canned dog and cat food and so on to assure them optimal amounts of all known nutrients. They couldn't pick out what they wanted. Unfortunately for human beings, we're left to TV advertisements and newspaper advertisements and magazine advertisements and ignorant trainers who tell people, well, just drink Gatorade, just drink water, and just drink Pepsi-Cola because we get good kickbacks from them. Doc, I tell you, this is incredible. In fact, I've got some young children that now, in the back of my head, I've got all these questions going through my head on how to make sure that they survive this ordeal of growing up and, and being athletes. But unfortunately, we are right down to the wire. We're going to have to ask you to come back and maybe do this again. Love to do it, Craig. I want to thank you for being with us. This has been Dr. Wallach, National Lecturer on the Dead Doctors Don't Lie series, best-selling author, physician, veterinarian, and all-around good guy. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. And for Craig Walcott here at Health Talk, have a healthy day. I'm here with one of my favorite guys, Mike Glenn, the stinger from the NBA from the Atlanta Hawks and currently commissioner of the WBA. How you doing, Mike? Oh, I'm doing good, Doc. I'm really glad to be here. I'm feeling good. I've already had my rebound drink today, so I'm fired up. Ready to go another game. Ready to go another game. Let's play two, as Ernie Banks used to say in the sports world. Well, um, one of the things that's really been fascinating for me over the years is to watch uh, athletes, uh, professional athletes, and uh, you'd like to think that fitness is is the answer to health and longevity, and yet the top athletes have a struggle. They break down, they get tendon problems, cartilage problems, ligament problems, they get bone problems, muscle problems, and you'd think if fitness was the answer to uh, solving health problems and living a long time, that, that professional athletes would have a very high percentage of them living to be 100. And with the exception, I, and I know this is a fact, Mike, Yes. With the exception of two black gentlemen from the old Negro baseball leagues, mm -hmm. there's never been a professional athlete ever lived behind it. You're right. One of those Ted Double Duty Ratcliffe, who was a catcher <laughs> and a pitcher in the Negro leagues, died at a 101, I believe it was. But you're absolutely right. Other than him, I don't nobody. Yeah, nobody. And uh, th there's a universal reason for this, of course. And and regardless of the sport you play in, whether it's basketball or football or hockey or soccer or boxing. Uh, whether it's skating or any other sport, whether it's amateur or professional, they all universally sweat. Yes. And when you're sweating, Mike, you know you're not just sweating out water, you're sweating out a, a soup that contains all the known essential nutrients. And if you're just drinking water, if you're just drinking soft drinks, if you're just drinking one of those energy drinks that has one or two nutrients, and we'll talk about them by the brand name in a few minutes, Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be sadly disappointed. You may get a little energy, but over the long haul, you're going to break down, and the odds are you're not going to make it to 100. And so what, what's your take on this? What have you seen over the years in professional basketball? Doc, uh, not only statistically doing research, but in my own personal life, I just turned 50 uh, this past uh, year, and seven guys that I played with in college uh, have passed on, all of them from health-related uh, occurrences, nothing accidental. So I see in my own life the deaths and so many of my former teammates in the NBA and college. They've had two hip replacements, knee replacements. They can hardly walk. They are really struggling. So I've seen it firsthand that a lot of the athletes, of course, we read about the super athletes like Kirby Puckett that recently passed and uh, the ultimate basketball hero of all, Wilt Chamberlain, a guy who averaged uh, over 48 minutes a game for an entire season, averaged 50 points a game. He was just superhuman for a season, and we see Wilt pass at 63, and, and other heroes of sports like, of course, Walter Payton, one of the greatest, if not 45. The, 
45, maybe the greatest football player that ever lived. And even somebody like Wilma Rudolph, whose records are still right up there at the top. And uh, it was years and years ago, 1960, since she won those three gold medals, but she was a tremendous athlete. She died at 54. 54, a natural athlete, had a, no type of enhancements whatsoever. And when we see great athletes like that, and even in our own communities, younger athletes than that dying, we know that there's something wrong, that the people that think if I'm just exercising, then I should live long, that the message should clearly be there for them. There are other things than exercising and being a great athlete as far as longevity and health is concerned. Yeah, you're exactly right, uh, Commissioner. I call you Commissioner. Yes, sir. And, um, you know, you look at somebody like Reggie Lewis, uh, died at 28. Uh, caught him out with a heart attack uh, during a. Actually, he had one heart attack during a playoff game with the Charlotte Hornets. Right. And then some weeks later, he died of a second heart attack, selenium deficiency. And then more recently, there was a young lady, uh, 19 years old, Rolanda Pierce. Uh, she's a freshman at Florida State University, uh, six foot five. Uh, she was going to be the Michael Jordan of the WNBA. She yes. was going to be it. She dies of a ruptured aneurysm at age 19, something a turkey wouldn't die from because we eliminated. Uh, ruptured aneurysms in Turkey is 1947. We learned that there is a simple little copper deficiency, and just by taking copper, you can prevent that. So I know the story, but why don't you share the story of one of our favorite uh, modern athletes, uh, Theo Rapp? Sure. I, of course, am uh, very knowledgeable of all the great nutritional products that I take and how they work. And as a broadcaster for the Atlanta Hawks, I was talking to one of the Hawks players, not Theo Ratliff, and I was speaking kind of quietly. This gentleman had several challenges, and I was talking to him a little bit about nutrition, and Theo overheard me. Theo said, Mike, can I, can I get with you? I want to talk to you about those nutritional things. And I met with Phil Oliver, a guy who had uh, introduced me to the products, and I said, Phil, we need to go out to dinner with Theo Ratliff. So we went out with Theo. Theo was a young, tremendous athlete. He had made the all-star team. Philadelphia 76ers had traded him to the Atlanta Hawks, which is a red flag right away. Why would you trade a young 6'10 shot blocker who's a tremendous person, follows all the trainer's instructions, all the coach's instructions. He's a family man. He's doing everything right. Why would you trade a guy like that? He was not a druggy felon. Exactly. <laughs> not a, exactly right. This is the kind of guy you want. You try to get on your team, not trade him away. So um, we met with Theo, uh, Doc, and we went over all the nutritional things that he needed, and we pointed out that he was very uh, deficient of his uh, nutrition that he needs daily, essential nutrition, and uh, we told him the things that he needed. We, uh, we told him he needed essential fatty acids. We told him he needed calcium. He needed plant-derived minerals. He needed a combination of plants, minerals, and amino acids, and he needed glucogel to really repair and rebuild himself. Theo listened and he followed our instructions. He took all of this nutrition morning and night. And uh, he did that and he really recreated himself. Theo had been a guy, Doc, that when he got to the Atlanta Hawks, his knees would swell, his uh, ankles were uh, arthritic, he had a detached bone in his hip. And Theo was like 26 years old. I mean, <laughs> yeah, old man's disease, he's 26 years old. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just like we were. Speaking of earlier, here he's sweating out all these nutrients. Yes. And he's not taking them back in to maintain and repair his body. Yes. Uh, he was not supporting that maintenance system. He was depending on aerobics and fitness and muscle training and strength training. Yes. Yep. Yes, because the trainers were telling him that, Doc. They were saying, well, maybe if you stretch a little bit more. So they had him on icing and stretching and lifting weights to strengthen those muscles in the areas of the injury, and none of it. He was continuously falling apart. So we said, Theo, if you'll take these things and if you'll take them every day, we can repair and rebuild you. And Theo did. He took them religiously. Uh, one of the few athletes that we've introduced this to that have recognized you can't just take it one time and say, oh, I didn't feel anything, so I just stopped taking it because they had been taking inferior products. So Theo took all of the nutrition. He went from a guy that missed 
79 out of 82 games the previous year. He only wow. played in three games, Doc, and I was right there in the locker room after it. After each one of those three, he was hurting. He was, oh, my hip is hurting. I don't know if I can play anymore. And coaches, we can, can you just uh, play a few minutes tomorrow night? <laughs> you know? He's 26 years old. Exactly. Like, and then, you know, the owners are thinking, we're paying you a lot of money for these little few minutes. Uh, all those uh, dynamics enter into professional sports. But he could not play anymore. Theo was just in pain, and he was only hurting himself further. So he went from there to taking all the nutrition to rebuilding himself. Theo got to the point where he was playing 82 games, pain-free. He wasn't even icing his knees. Now, I played 10 years in the NBA. All centers ice their knees. That's standard equipment. You put your shoes on, you ice your knees after the game. Those go together. So Theo was so healthy, he had no pain in his knees, no pain in his hip. He was pain-free. He was just jumping out of the gym, just blocking shots, led the NBA in shots blocked, and uh, was one of the top vote getters for Defensive Player of the Year. Theo was recreated. He was healthier than he had ever been before. Well, and then I know something really, really good happened to him after those uh, two great seasons uh, with the Hawks. What, what, mm -hmm. what happened then? Well, uh, we were talking, Phil Oliver and I were talking about how he had really uh, – come around and been created. And Phil came up with the idea. He said, we need to really have a sports drink built around Theo so that when Theo is uh, out there, he can take all these nutritional um, drinks and supplements while he's playing. And that's when we came to you, Doc, and we said, can we devise an energy drink that's full of this nutrition so that while Theo is playing and other athletes and other everyday people, while they're living their everyday lives, they can take this energy drink and feel an immediate sustainable energy boost that will take them throughout the game and they'll even feel better the next day. So it sounded like a tall order, but we knew that it could be filled. And, and that's exactly what happened. Rebound FX was... Uh, created. Uh, we tossed around what would be a good name, and we thought that Theo had rebounded his career and rebound such a, a part of basketball, rebounding, uh, you know, uh, you, you can't win without rebounding. So all of that made a lot of sense, and we came up with the name Rebound FX, and Theo has taken it. Theo has introduced it to a lot of other professional athletes, as we have as well, and it has just developed and earned the reputation of being the best sports drink in the world. And coming from a sports uh, background, my nickname is The Stinger, and all people know you have to earn your nickname. So if your name is Rebound FX, you have to earn it, and Rebound has certainly earned that name, Rebound FX. Yeah, I can remember there's one professional basketball player, I can't mention his name, but I can remember one guy, uh, one of the top NBA players, uh, he wasn't going to play on a Sunday, and we were at one of those uh, basketball clinics on Saturday, mm -hmm. and they actually had to have one of the kids who was there who was going back to Miami mm -hmm. hand carry a case of rebound FX to this basketball player because he wasn't going to play without it. That's right. <laughs> what a great story, Doc. You're right. The trying out for the WBA, you mentioned I'm the commissioner of the World Basketball Association. It's a young league. We work with young guys and try to give them opportunities, exposure, and development. This young kid had come up to Atlanta to try out, come from Miami to try out. And uh, one of our professional athletes that is taking rebound had a game that Sunday. And as you know, FedEx and uh, UPS and a lot of the uh, services that deliver don't really do it uh, very often on the weekend. So we were having a real difficult time because he had to have it. He knows the benefits of it. We show the comparison of rebound to athletes, and they know how significant it is to get any little edge because the difference in winning and losing in superstar and a regular player in making the NBA not is sometimes fractions of a second. So any edge that they can get, athletes know they want it. So uh, this kid was going back to Miami, and we, we had the idea. We met with the kid and said, look, we've got an athlete that needs this rebound desperately. Can you, on your trip back, Take a cab. As soon as you get to the Miami airport, take a cab, go directly to the arena, meet the security guard in the back door, and give this uh, rebound FX to this athlete, and he will give you two 
courtside seats for it. Wow. <laughs> the kid was so elated and so happy. He said, will I? <laughs> I'll be glad to. So the kid was, uh, we didn't have to tell him about the benefits of rebound. It was obvious if this professional athlete, superstar athlete, wanted it this much, it had to be very good. And he got a chance to sit on the floor right near the player's bench and see the game as he'd never seen it before and, and see rebound at work. The athlete got his, uh, his energy drink and he drank it throughout the game and the benefits. It was just a win-win and a beautiful story for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I love that story. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. And of course, you don't have to be a basketball star, or a football star, a boxing star, a baseball star to take rebound FX. If you're the sort of person who needs to pick me up of a cup of coffee or a soft drink at 10 in the morning, at 3 in the afternoon, at 8 o'clock at night, um, you want to try Rebound FX. Uh, it does not have carbonation. It doesn't have sugar. It doesn't have uh, phosphates in it. It doesn't have the things that are negatives uh, from the standpoint of nutrition. And uh, as a result, we find that the people who are using Rebound FX are people in addition to the athletes. Of course, it was originally designed for athletes. This is, this is like gasoline for a high-performance race car, and you're not often going to get to use that in street cars, you know, out in the street, because it's just such a high-performance fuel. Right. Well, here's a high-performance fuel for professional athletes that's accessible and usable by the average person on the street, whether you're kind of a weekend warrior and you play in the company's softball league, right. yeah, or mm -hmm. you like to go bowling on a Friday night, or you just like to um, oh, play tennis or bas pick up basketball. Um, there, there are so many people who um, break down, uh, regardless of their age, whether they're in their teens, or their young adults in their 20s or 30s, yet middle-aged people, and they break down. They say to me, Doc, I, I don't know why I'm breaking down like this. I'm doing everything right. I'm doing all my fitness stuff, and um, I'm drinking all the water. I'm keeping hydrated. I'm exercising or I'm drinking one of these other sports drinks, uh, energy drinks, and you start showing them the comparison. Right. And they say, well, wait a minute, this very famous sports drink only has two minerals in it, and Rebound FX has 77 plant minerals. It has a total of 128 nutrients in it. Wow. So how can you compare an energy drink that has two nutrients versus one that has 128? Right? It's just impossible. It, and Doc, oftentimes when I'm telling athletes that, I'll say, imagine now that you're in the boxing ring. We're going a few years back, and I show them the comparison. I say, uh, you got this one-minute break between rounds, and you're fighting a young Mike Tyson. Which one do you want? So <laughs> that brings it home clearly right away. Give me a double dose of the rebound, they say. So they, athletes really see the difference, though, the comparison, all the nutrition, the energy, the pickup, the ability to sustain your energy. It's just a no-brainer for anybody, really. <laughs> you know, Rebound FX has really taken off, Mike, and just because it is a performance drink, it is an energy drink, mm -hmm. and it is a nutrient replacement, not only a... a fluid replacer, but it's also a nutrient replacer, and it's so convenient, you don't even have to pay for a lot of water to be shipped to you. It comes in a concentrate. You can get the uh, samples, a one serving sample, or you can get the concentrate that has 32 servings in it. You can make it really concentrated as 32 half quarts, or as it's designed for 32 quarts. And you're only paying for the shipping of one quart of water instead of 32. So we're very excited about the system. It's uh, really been very well received by the professional athletes from all sports. Uh, can you recall any comments that maybe some of these professional athletes have had about Rebound FX? Oh, I have, Doc. So many athletes have really taken to it, and they've just ordered it in bulk. I mean, we have entire teams that will purchase as much as almost $2,000 worth at one time and say, I want to have this here for the remainder of the year, and I don't want to have to worry about when it's shipments coming in, and they just take it every day. They just will not go on the court without it. It becomes that much more part of you. You just become, you feel so much better when you're walking on the floor with that confidence as well as the energy. Your body is just feeling good, and they know they can play at a very high level. So we've had athletes at every level, whether they're in the peewee level, the high school level, the collegiate level, or the professional ranks, and, and in all sports, whether they've been football, boxing, basketball, baseball, track, you name it, we've had athletes across the board that have just really loved taking rebound to FX. 
Well, you're a kind of an all-around guy, and one of the many, many reasons we have a deep respect for you and we love you is that um, uh, you developed this league for deaf basketball players. Yes. And uh, we really, really appreciate that. And, and are these kids using the Rebound FX? Yes, Doc, I'm glad you asked about that. This is a, of course, my dad coached at Georgia School for the Deaf, so I grew up around deaf kids. He coached basketball, track, and softball there in the late 50s and early 60s. So I grew up around deaf kids, and I developed the nation's first basketball camp for deaf kids. So we get high school age boys and girls, basically from all across the country, to come to my camp. We have a week long of regular basketball camp, three times a day. And on the last night of the camp, we play an all-star game where my best deaf kids play against local all-stars from the community. So they're kind of tired. It's been a long week, but they're very excited about representing the Mike Glenn camp for the hearing impaired and about deaf people showing that they can play basketball as well as anybody else. And uh, so we played, and I remember the first time I introduced uh, Rebound FX to them, I just told them very briefly, this is a good drink, it has some nutrition, it'll help your energy, so we're going to have it available for the game. So they said, okay, and you know how high school kids are, they want to hire it taste and what is it, and they have been so accustomed to other sports drinks. And so I just put it out, and they were coming from it, and I, I told them, huh, drink some of this. I had someone to give it to them, and I saw their reactions when they go back on the court they had the energy and they came back and I say, which one you, I want some more of that one. They were signed and they wanted the one with the rebound in it. And they didn't even know of all the nutritional things, but all the whole teams, the girls and the boys were taking it. And after the game, they were saying, how can I get some more of that? So without hearing the whole story and knowing what it was going to do for them, that's like just a blind test. It was for a deaf test in this case, <laughs> <laughs> but these kids just tried it felt it, they knew it worked, and they wanted it. So, And we've had rebound available for them throughout the week now for the last couple of years. But it is just a part of the deaf community, the deaf sports scene, and still growing uh, in every avenue you can imagine. Well, thank you for that uh, feedback, Mike. And, and since you brought up the test word, yes. um, the thing that we're really proud of with Rebound FX and many other of our products is the fact that um, in New Zealand, which is probably the toughest country in the world when it comes to testing urine and testing sweat of uh, players to make sure that they're not taking anything that gives them an advantage, something that's been banned, mm -hmm. uh, it's been approved by the, the agencies uh, in uh, New Zealand that test for these things, and therefore it's also approved, because they're the toughest in the world, mm -hmm. it's also um, been approved by the IOC. Wow. The International Olympic Committee. And what, what does that do? I mean, I know that a amateur and professional athletes got to be worried when they're going to take something new. Is it going to affect um, their, their ability to play? Is, are they going to get banned from playing if they take something with some weird herb in it or something that shows up in their urine, their sweat, or their blood? Um, how, how important is that to a player? That is, Doc, because there's so much uh, emphasis on it now in the media. Every all the emphasis on steroids or different drugs that uh, and athletes that have died, famous athletes, and often they try to infer that it was because of something that they were taking or, uh, rather than something that they're not taking. Yeah, there was a baseball player who died of uh, something and right. they attributed it to the ephedra that he was yes. taking. And yes. uh, then, boy, Congress got in it and they, they banned mm -hmm. ephedra. And then an attorney went back and sued the government and the FDA to get ephedra back on the market but it has to be like a very, very tiny, tiny dose. You'd have to take mm. a whole bottle, get the same dose as you used to be able to get. Oh, okay, right. And I think that, Doc, has uh, scared a few people. Like, is it Fedrin? <laughs> so so they, they have this uh, undue alarm. So to know that it has been stringently tested, that these are beneficial nutrients, and that's what we really stress to people, that this is nutrition. This is not some drug or chemicals that you're putting in your body. This is the safest and the best thing because they are plant-derived minerals, have been pre-digested by plants, and so we explain that to them because uh, there is this concern that if it's anything new that they've not heard of, that maybe it's one of those banned substances that are will either make them Ill illegal to play or will hurt them in the long run. But once we tell them these factors, they, they take it with confidence and they know they feel it and like it, and then uh, they pretty, pretty much go on from there. Yeah, this is... Uh 
uh, Rebound and several other products from, from uh, our wonderful um, collection of products has been approved by at least one and, and maybe two agencies in New Zealand. And again, it's the toughest one in the world. And so the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, mm -hmm. just as long as New Zealand says it's okay, mm -hmm. they don't even look at it sideways. And so um, this has really opened up the whole amateur athletic league, whether it's junior high, high school, uh, university, Olympics. And we're so very proud of that because we don't want these young kids who work so hard. They learn the sport, the, the actual technology of the sport. They learn the system of the sports, and then they get fit, and then they start breaking down. And it's always the top ones. Yes. It's always and the top It is, Doc, and I think the top ones work harder. You know, uh, people in sports recognize that. Sometimes people outside of sports think they're just naturally gifted, which they are gifted, or that they're just naturally blessed, and it comes easily to them. But from my experience as a professional player, from interviewing, writing books about them, and seeing how they work, the guys that are stars are usually the hardest working guys on your team, which means naturally they sweat the most, they lose their minerals the most, and we found these adverse health effects on the best players because they, they sweat the most. I mean, they put more energy, more emotion, more time. They're into the playoffs. In the NBA, if your team does not make the playoffs, your season is over by the middle of April. But if you're going to the championship game every year, then you're going on to toward the end of June. So you have much more intense games and practices, and you add that year to year to year. Those superstars that are going that those extra miles they're going to be the one most adversely affected. Well, um, thank you so much for sharing all this information. And I know that people are going to want to hear this, this um, uh, material mm -hmm. that's going to be so vital to their long-term health and also their day-to-day -day health on the short term because nobody wants to be walking around on crutches. Nobody wants to be sitting in the chair when you want to be out playing. That's the truth, Doc. And, you know, you made me think of something else very quickly, though. Uh, my wife, who is a, uh, she likes to walk and exercise, try to stay firm and slim. Uh, around this area, Doc, in the Atlanta area, you have a lot of people that like walking up Stone Mountain and walking around the mountain. So you have a lot of people that are just doing those kind of exercise daily. And I know Phil's wife likes to do these kind of things as well. And they both are taking this Rebound FX uh, every day. They're taking it to walk the mountain for their exercise. All their friends are taking it. So even if you're not, as we've mentioned, a professional athlete and you're competing at that level, if you're just an everyday person that wants a little extra energy and nutrition, uh, it works very effectively. It tastes great and uh, it gives them that little extra energy and they'll, they'll do an extra mile or two when they're taking that rebound and they find out that uh, they'll lose weight quicker and, actually, and feel better after they finish walking. Okay, I'm going to end this, uh, Mike, with rebound, rebound. That's our drink. <laughs> I like that. Yes, indeed. Let's be back in the sports world. <laughs> okay, T, you hear Mike, Lynn, and both Mike and Dr. Wallach talking about, you know, rebound and how we came about with rebound and uh, basically how our relationship, yourself and myself and Mike, um, but I wanted you to kind of tell your story and just kind of emphasize why were you such a different athlete in receiving this versus your colleagues, and what has it meant to you? Well, Phil, um, you know, it, it's been tremendous to me as far as uh, helping rebuild my career and furthering me along and giving me the ability to extend my career. Um, you know, it's been well documented of the different type of injuries that I've had throughout my career. And it always got to a point where I couldn't figure out what was going on with my body. and. Um, I overheard Mike Glenn speaking to one of my teammates when I was with the Atlanta Hawks back in about 2002, talking about minerals and calcium and mineral deficiency. And so when I heard him, I said, yo, Mike, come over here and speak to me about that a little bit. And um, he graciously, as he is, as, as he is a man, just came over to and gave me some knowledge about what it was he was speaking of. And it was uh, profound in what he was, what he was speaking about because I had never had it put to me in that manner as far as athletes be becoming mineral and calcium deficient, you know, throughout their sweating out of all their minerals during play and also with the amount of energy and stuff that we exert during play. 
you know, I become a deficient in those areas. So he told me about the great products at uh, Longevity, and I was able to get on the products diligently, you know, and rebuild, you know, the cartilage from my hip injury, from my knee injury, and just all the different things that I had going on at the time. You know, I was in a situation where I had the hip injury where I couldn't figure out what was going on and, you know, why these things was just happening to me, you know, because I always try to keep myself in a superb physical health and always ready to get out there and, and play ball. But, you know, I was getting these minor injuries, knick-knack injuries and stuff that was just stopping me from continuing to be the player that I was. You know, like I said, with the minerals, that all changed. Once I got on the minerals and got to doing the Pig Pack Plus and taking the calcium and being diligent on it and taking it, you know, as it was food, you know, every single day, twice a day, I was able to rebuild my body and to be able to extend my, uh, my playing career. Well, Theo, you know, you, uh, they had a rap on you that you were the kind of guy that got a lot of injuries. So why don't you just try to tell me when did your injury start and what, you know, at what point did you realize that there was something else that you needed to do? Well, I was di diagnosed even when I first came into the league. They said I had a degenerative bone problem. Now, how so old were you then? That, that was when I just had come out of college. I, I wasn't any more than... 22, 21, 22 years old at the time. So I had back issues. So as they looked at the uh, MRI, I had to take MRI and a whole bunch of exams in order for to, teams to even take me. I had to take all these things to try to make sure that, you know, everything would stay intact. And they gave me, you know, only five or six years in the league tops was where I would be at my – you know, at my peak position and everything would be down here from there because they saw the degenerative changes that early in my career. You know, lo and behold, I was able to extend, you know, my career as far as um, being able to play and be, you know, I was in a position where I was in the playoffs uh, in at, as an all-star in 2001, right before um, I received my hip injury, which... No, right before I received my wrist injury, where I just went up for a block shot, just normally coming down, trying to catch myself, you know, fracturing my wrist, having to have surgery, and then traded to the Hawks. And um, then my wrist healed. And during that same summer, right before the season started, I ended up tearing college. I didn't know what it was. I just went up for the ball, jumped for a ball, a routine thing that I do, you know, a thousand times a game and end up tearing cartilage in my hip. Nobody knew what the diagnosis was. You know, I had to go see all these specialists and different things that were, you know, and finally figure out what was going on. So I had to have a surgery for that. And in my trying to recovery from that surgery, I just um, wasn't getting back to being able to play the game. And it had gotten to a point where I had sat out all year, tried to come back a couple of times, and it just wouldn't happen for me. So I had, you know, lost faith in, you know, what was going on as far as with trying to heal and was real discouraged with what the doctors and stuff were saying. And, you know, I thought I was pretty much done with it because I wouldn't be able to be the same player that I was before I had the hip injury. But... With, with that said, um, I had a great guy, Phil Oliver, to school me on exactly what I needed to do as far as taking the minerals and the calcium along with Mike Glenn and, you know, just got over my problem by being diligent on taking the product. And so from that, we produce rebound. Yes. So how yes. is rebound, now that we have this rebound effects, how has it benefited you and even some of your colleagues? Well, after being such a diligent uh, a student of the minerals and the calcium and constantly uh, rebuilding my body, um, we kind of jointly, me, Phil, Mike, kind of jointly came up with the idea of having an energy drink to help sustain me throughout 
the game. When everybody else was going down in the fourth quarter, my energy was still elevating and staying at its peak position. And, you know, with that said, being three-time, you know, shot block leader, you know, one of the top defenders in the league, being um, pretty much winner up to being defensive, uh, defensive player of the year and different things of that nature, um, it definitely it helped excel my career. And by me having such a success, me seeing the success that I had, I wanted to, wanted to go out to my colleagues and try to introduce them to these products as far as with the minerals and have them to understand what, what's going on with their bodies when they're going out, they're sweating, sweating out their minerals, using your calcium during play, and being able to replenish themselves with something that was healthy at the same time efficient. So prior to that, nobody explained to you about sweat, how important it's what you're sweating out is replacing it back in. Prior to meeting Dr. Wallach, Mike Glenn, and of course myself, no one, because you were around nutritionists, you were around doctors, no one ever um, explained it to you in that manner. No, no, no one ever really broke it down to me on what minerals are, how they work. You know, we get the basic four food groups and you need to be eating more carbohydrates and different things of that nature, but never to the detail on what helps build your body and what helps you sustain your body as far as how you lose and sweat, how, how you losing your minerals through sweat and different things of that nature. No one ever sat down you know, until I met you, you uh, Phil, Mike, and Dr. Wallach, and they really uh, educated me on that. And so now we have a crusade. We're trying to just expose this information to not only just athletes, Yes, but yes, to yes, everybody yes. who needs energy, everybody needs these minerals. How often do you need them? Oh, you need minerals, like I said, just like you have food. You know, every single day you need to replenish yourself with the right minerals and, you know, to help have longevity, you know, in life. You know, to, to live with, you know, being disease-free, you know, different things of that nature. And being able to have a healthy lifestyle. That's, that's what it's all about. That's our crusade is to try to give everybody ultimate health. Well, I tell you, that's a great crusade, and uh, we thank God for you for Rebound FX, and I think we'll sign off with saying, let's go rebound. <laughs> let's go rebound. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs>